Howdy. Well, welcome to another episode of Free Speech Zone. And last week I was beginning to, well, let's backstep a bit. Whenever you're talking about 9-11, you have to know that uh, people resist it. People uh, don't want to believe that our own government could commit such a, an atrocity. And then you hear people say, yeah, the Jews did it. The Jews did it. Well, yeah, they did. The Jews did do it. Along with our government, they conspired together. They have common motives of, you know, conquering their mutual areas and all that jazz. But anyway, so we started showing this documentary showing that the Israelis were perfectly willing to attack the USS Liberty with the purpose of killing everybody on board, sinking the ship, blaming it on Egypt, bringing America into the... Uh, the war to go attack Egypt and Iraq so Israel had America to fight the war for it and that was the whole point of that but miraculously they survived now last week we had played roughly the first half and it was kind of a coincidence that they they were playing taps just as the show ended so I've backed up the video to just before they started playing taps and we're going to play the last half of it right now and then we'll go on with a little more of this explanation so go ahead and take it away. Peter. Uh, boats came in closer and began to machine gun the uh, ship using armor piercing projectiles. The armor piercing, the shells that they were using were leaving holes about that big around in the, the metal plating. Just peeled it out like it was orange peel. At close range, the armor-piercing rounds ripped through the steel hull of the ship. Nowhere was safe. This bullet was retrieved from one of the navigational books at the rear portion of the bridge. It had penetrated the skin of the ship, gone through at least one other book, and then stopped in, in the second book. This is part of an armor-piercing shell. The outer portion or jacket makes the hole that this then goes through. And a bullet like this that hit uh, Seaman Francis Brown and, and killed him. He died right on the spot. Just fell to the floor dead. He was just barely 18. There weren't enough helmets to go around for everyone. It was like sitting in a cardboard box and having somebody shoot through it. The, the bullets were just coming everywhere. Throughout the attack, the Liberty had been silent to the outside world. All its aerials were either smashed or jammed. We had one whip antenna which hadn't worked the entire cruise and it had a bullet hole in it. One of the radio men had taken a, a reel of coax cable and ran it from one of the transmitters back there to that whip antenna and took some shrapnel in the process. He got out and made a Firefox, Firefox, this is Rockstar, Rockstar. Under attack by unidentified surface and naval air units require immediate assistance. The American Sixth Fleet was 500 miles away and picked up the signal. So did the Israeli armed forces. The attack stopped shortly afterwards. The American aircraft carriers were in the middle of a nuclear weapons drill and had to rearm with conventional bombs before they could take off. Once the Israelis knew the U.S. jets were in the air, they summoned the American naval attaché and told him there had been a terrible mistake. The American planes were recalled. As they returned, Israeli helicopters flew out to the Liberty. This one had some personnel from the uh, Israeli government and the U.S. Naval Attaché dropped a uh, brown paper sack on the deck in the fore part of the ship, weighted down with an orange, had a business card in it. It landed right next to the severed leg of one of the deck personnel. And the note said, Do you have casualties? pretty obvious that there were casualties. I mean, there's still body parts. 
and blood streaming down the bulkheads. So his message, do you have casualties, was kind of out of place. One of the sailors carried that sack back to the captain. And the captain took out the note and read it, looked up at the helicopter and popped the social finger at him. June the 8th, 1967, the height of the Six-Day War. The USS Liberty, an American spy ship, had just been attacked by Israeli jets and torpedo boats while in international waters off Egypt. Badly damaged, two-thirds of its crew were dead or wounded. As soon as the news reached Washington, the attack on the Liberty instantly triggered a domestic political crisis. According to documents released under the Freedom of Information Act, one solution suggested in American government circles was to sink the liberty so journalists could not photograph it and inflame public opinion against the Israelis. The NSA rejected this idea with an impolite comment. Handling the media became the top priority. I was taken to my home in White Oak, Maryland. My name is uh, Patricia Blue Rishakis, and my husband was killed on the Liberty. And by the time I got there, there were any number of people from the National Security Agency there. They were there to make sure that I didn't speak to anyone uh, from the press, and I didn't. They stayed night and day. Back in the Mediterranean, the Liberty was now listing at 10 degrees, a massive hole in the hull, above and below the waterline. The planes that they said they were sending to us never arrived. What I was afraid of, and I think most of us, was that we were going to sink. Well, the mess decks was, uh, was pretty much littered with the wounded. It looks like something out of a horror movie, with people standing around or lying, wounded and dead and stunned, the heads missing, parts of their bodies. The Liberty had only one doctor on board, with very limited medical resources. There was not a table that wasn't being used with a body on it, or a wounded body on it. The doctor fixed compound fractures and treated bullet and shrapnel wounds, while blood transfusions were given arm to arm. It was, um, it was real bad. And the doctor said to him, do you want me to operate? He says, you're probably going to die if I do it, and you'll certainly die if I don't. And, and he said, go ahead, doctor. And so when the doctor operated, uh, we held him as tight as we could. It was horrible pain, I'm sure, for him. And uh, all of a sudden, he went, he went limp, and he died right there. I don't want to ever see anything like that again. Captain McGonagall received a pretty bad leg injury, lost a lot of blood. He was navigating by the stars. We had a, a little bit of power and tons of water in our belly, which meant the ship waved back and forth all night long. The next day, American ships arrived to take the injured and the dead off the Liberty. The American government now made sure that no journalists could get anywhere near the crew. When they took the severely wounded to various parts, they uh, actually posted guards on their room so that no one could be interviewed by the press. The total press blackout was in effect. Back in Washington, the government ensured there was little information for the press, while politics went on behind closed doors. I was told to go up urgently to the uh, seventh floor. Well, my name is Bill Woolley. I was in charge of the Arab-Israel desk. Sit in because the Secretary uh, of State himself, Dean Rusk, had summoned uh, Ambassador Harmon of Israel to come in urgently. And uh, uh, so I sat through the meeting taking notes, and uh, in a loud voice, the Secretary was, was really demanding some explanation for why and what had happened. The ambassador himself 
seemed to be ignorant of the incidents. He immediately said, I can't believe what you're telling me. It's, it would be impossible. It would be unheard of. It was especially tough for Lyndon Johnson, to date, the most pro-Israeli American president in history. Johnson was uh, in a very tough mood. Uh, I'm Tom Hughes. I was director in the State Department, director of intelligence and research at the time of the um, Liberty incident in 67. Attack on the Liberty, Johnson himself briefed Newsweek magazine off the record that the Israelis had attacked, and the reason they'd attacked was that they thought this was an intelligence ship that was intercepting perhaps Israeli as well as Egyptian communications. But then everything changed. The fact that Johnson himself was the leaker uh, and briefer of Newsweek was soon leaked. And this alarmed, of course, the Israeli embassy and, and their, their leading friends in the Jewish organizations. And the Israeli embassy uh, regarded this as a major problem uh, and that uh, the, the, what Johnson had told Newsweek uh, practically amounted to blood libel. Declassified Israeli documents show they were going to threaten President Johnson with blood libel, gross anti-Semitism, and that would end his political career. Blackmail. This is Admiral Bobby R. Inman, U.S. Navy retired. I'm a former director of the National Security Agency. But they know if he is thinking about running again, he's going to need money for his campaign. Uh, so uh, alleging that he's blood libeling is going to arouse the Jewish donors. The Israeli government hired teams of lawyers, some of whom were close friends of Lyndon Johnson, and began an all-out offensive. They lent on the media to kill critical stories and slanted others in favor of Israel. There was a, a campaign mounted to s see if what could be done about returning Johnson to his normal, uh, predictable pro-Israeli position. At the time, Johnson was still undecided as to whether to run for president the following year. Efforts were to be made to remind the president of the delicacy of his own position, that he personally uh, would, might lose support uh, for his run for re-election in 1968. Israeli tactics were clever. They identified Johnson's soft spot, the war in Vietnam, and gave him two extraordinary gifts, neither of which were made public at the time. The first was political. Well, one of Johnson's complaints about Israel was that many of the Jewish organizations and the heads of uh, leaders in the Jewish community were opposing him on Vietnam. And they were suddenly becoming more silent on Vietnam as the liberty crisis uh, moved. So he also knew that there was a move back in his favor if he was moderate on Israel. There was a second gift, much more secret, but vital to the American president. The dreadful death toll in Vietnam was dominating the domestic news agenda. The North Vietnamese had Russian surface-to-air missiles, which were bringing down American aircraft on a daily basis. The American military attaché in Israel got a surprise visit from a senior Israeli intelligence officer. Took some helicopters and went across the North Red Sea to the surface-to-air missile sites and not only captures them, but took back everything. The launchers, the missiles, the, the manu maintenance manuals, the rest of it. And then he went to the U.S. Embassy, to the air attaché, and said, I think I have something you might be interested in. And, of course, those were the same missiles that our aircraft flying over North Vietnam were encountering day to day. And countermeasures was a huge issue. So grateful was the American government, they gave Israel two gifts in return. They resupplied them with the weapons they had just lost in the war, and the Liberty Inquiry, run by the Department of Defense, the DOD, was watered down. All that's influenced by what have we benefited from, from the captured SA-2 missile sites. Soon, uh, Johnson did respond, 
and took a much more lenient line and wished that the whole incident could be put behind us as soon as possible. Johnson's softer approach to Israel was immediately reflected in the American Navy inquiry, which was now underway on board the Liberty. We began to realize that a cover-up was, was, was descending upon us. A lot of people that were in a key position to offer testimony were not given that opportunity. I testified to the machine gunning of life rafts, to the captain's state of mind, and uh, it was that those two issues in particular were totally omitted. Lloyd Painter was not the only officer to have his testimony ignored. I saw what looked like unburned Vaseline, and I scraped a little bit of it off and put it in the jar and sealed the cap on. And I presented it to the Court of Inquiry, and that's the last I saw of that jar. There was no mention of napalm, and I'm sure that's what it was. They didn't want to hear any of that. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know it until many months later that none of that had been recorded. Looking back on it, it was a total sham. The U.S. Court of Inquiry reported in just 20 days. It was a rush job, full of spelling mistakes, much key evidence ignored, no Israelis interviewed, and it exonerated them from blame. I read the Court of Inquiry and realized that my statements had been stricken from the record and never recorded. So I, I knew then for certain that the cover-up was, was massive. The Israelis then rushed out their own report, which concluded that the whole affair was a series of mistakes and that no one was to blame. The only dissenting voice was that of the Israeli ambassador in Washington. He sent a secret telegram back home arguing that Israel was clearly guilty. He cited the audio tape of the attack, the existence of which was known to top Israeli officials, and mentioned the crucial 20-minute gap that followed the Liberty's identification and the launch of the torpedoes against her. He said they should own up to what they had done and put the guilty on trial. His advice was ignored. The focus now was to repair the damage to American-Israeli relations. The Israelis have always been very skillful at uh, tracking what the US government is doing, saying, thinking, and uh, effort to influence it. And they're by no means the only country that does it, many do. They're just more effective at it than most. And the great advantage they have as compared to other countries uh, is their influence in the Congress. Around the time of the attack, the Washington Post had noted that the Jewish lobby could help determine the outcome of 169 of the 270 electoral votes needed to win the White House. The big emotive words about the attack disappeared from press releases at the Pentagon and a much more bland and neutral sounding uh, discourse uh, occurred. And this was true of the private uh, briefings that uh, official people in the Pentagon made about the incident. But whatever was said to journalists, every U.S. intelligence head believed the attack was intentional. One of them wrote, a nice whitewash for a group of ignorant, stupid and inept X, X, X. The Jewish community has always been uh, more generous than many of their other counterparts in supporting financially uh, elections, political causes in the process. That does translate into influence. Many of Johnson's closest friends and advisors were pro-Israeli, and they reported back to Tel Aviv on his every move. The Israeli story constantly shifted to counter whatever new intelligence the White House received. So sensitive were these communications that the Israelis used code names to protect the identity of their White House agents. But for the first time, the members of the ring can be named. Hamlet was a million dollar fundraiser for the Democrats. When he rang, Johnson took his calls. He was Abe Feinberg. Menashe was Arthur Goldberg, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Harare was David Ginsburg, a high-profile Washington lawyer who also represented the Israeli embassy. Ilan was Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas. Lyndon Johnson had dinner with him on the eve of the Six-Day War. The strategy worked. The U.S.-Israeli relationship proved to be stronger than the killing and injuring of more than 200 Americans. The American-Israeli relationship was very much at stake and it uh, 
was brought back from the precipice. The crucial intelligence came from the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Arthur Goldberg. He warned Tel Aviv that the United States had the audio tape which revealed Israeli pilots knew it was an American ship before they attacked. The tape was quietly buried. I think a conscious decision was made to sweep it under the rug, to put it behind. My reading is that the U.S. government had made a decision to uh, accept the apology and reject the, you know, the rationale, but don't push it further. With the politics sorted, the only remaining issue was the fate of the USS Liberty, badly damaged and now in Malta for extensive repairs. The torpedo hole was massive and was revealed to be much bigger once they got the ship into dry dock and drained it of water. The sealed compartment was a water-filled tomb, full of bodies, body parts, and top secret equipment. You could smell death and you could smell oil, that's what I remember. As soon as the air hit the bodies, they began to deteriorate rapidly. You do what you have to do. They were your shipmates. Still are. The Navy was more concerned with equipment parts than they were body parts. But when I went down, I knew that you couldn't separate the two. We had to start shoveling up the, uh, the, the, the parts, 168 bags worth. Elsewhere, the makeup artists were getting to work. We were in the dry dock about six weeks. And 300 Maltese workers are working two shifts a day, and I think seven days a week to try. They were cutting out the shell holes, welding plates over that and uh, fabricating metal to cover the torpedo hole. And then in one day, they painted the entire ship. We looked like nothing ever happened. We took it across the Atlantic. It was like being in a cemetery. But when we pulled into port, we looked good. This press and everything were there. And uh, we looked like basically nothing really happened. So it was great for the press to downplay what really happened to us. While the survivors met the widows and friends, the 168 bags of body parts and top secret equipment were quietly taken to an incinerator and burnt. A year later, and the Liberty Captain William McGonagall was given the Medal of Honor, America's highest award for gallantry. The tradition has always been that it is presented by the president in the White House. I look at these two gallant Marines and I see America. Captain McGonagall never heard words like these from his commander-in-chief. There was no television coverage for him as he received his medal in a quiet ceremony in the Navy Yard. President Johnson was just four miles away at the time. He stayed in the White House to hand out diplomas to school children. The reason was revealed in this internal memo, which advised President Johnson that due to the nature and sensitivity of these awards, they should be given by the Department of Defense, not by him. The advice was clear. No press release regarding them should be made. When I received my Purple Heart in a, in a secret ceremony in the captain's office, I was admonished, threat of court-martial, don't ever tell anyone where you got this. Don't ever tell anyone how you got this medal. The following year, American aid to Israel increased fourfold, and President Johnson agreed a treaty classified above top secret with Israel for the mutual exchange of intelligence, an arrangement which is still in place today, codenamed Stone Ruby. One of the things that bothers me is there wasn't a nice explanation of what went on. No one wants to talk about the why. The big secret the Israelis wanted to protect was their next move. They had told the Americans that this was to be a limited war and not a land grab. 
but on June 8, 1967, their forces were poised to attack and seize the Golan Heights and invade Syria, something they wished to keep from the White House until they'd done it. Successive American administrations, both Republican and Democrat, had refused to deal with the liberty. Even the issue of war crimes against unarmed Americans has never been addressed. There was a war crimes report filed by the Liberty Veterans Association to address the issues of such war crimes as firing on life rafts. That was never answered properly. I don't think it was answered, period. The people who were responsible for attacking the liberty, liberty were, you know, by and large, the military individuals in the war room. I don't know how many, four, eight, ten. Um, those are the people who came up with the plan. Those are the individuals who were responsible for the attack. The pilots, the motor torpedo boat personnel, they were ordered. You know, you don't follow orders, go to, go to jail. So they have to follow through. It wasn't the Israeli people who ordered that attack. It wasn't the average Jewish person who ordered that attack. We really need to exonerate the average Jewish person, Israeli, from this and go towards those individuals who are responsible for the attack. No one was really willing to take this on. Not the Star State Department, the White House, not the Congress. It's in everybody's best interest to just let this go. And that's exactly what they did. But by doing that, they left a lot of pain for the survivors and for the families because there was a lot of uh, broken families broken marriages, alcoholism, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so those, uh, those crew members suffered a lot, but so did the families. The hardest part was the, the reaction of our own government toward us. And we were actually, the fingers were pointed at us. And uh, the Israelis were, they, weren't, they, they were never questioned as to why they did it. They only questioned us. The families still want answers from their government, which remains silent. For many, some memories never fade. We had a wonderful time just being together. I met Alan um, at a party. We spent a lot of time talking throughout the evening. And at the end of the evening, he said to me, um, are you busy tomorrow afternoon? And I said, well, no. And he said, do you think we could get married? Then I was told that he was among the dead. It was absolutely the worst moment of my life. There's not a day that doesn't go by where I don't think about those guys. I mean, I went through hell, but they left the earth. When I'm walking up to the mass grave, I still feel a connection with those people. Hard to explain, but it's still there, so I want to remember that connection as long as I can. What we shared, what we felt. It took 13 years of haggling before both sides finally agreed a compensation deal for the ship. By 1980, the bill plus interest was just over $17 million. Israel offered six. The Americans accepted, then sold the Liberty for $100,000 scrap. The settlement for the victims was quicker, but many are still unhappy with it today. I did not feel it was a fair settlement. I would have bought it. But I was so uh, sad and broken. Um, I just didn't have the energy to take on that fight. And it wasn't a fight that I thought I could win. The State Department um, were very eager for the uh, survivors to make that settlement. They sent a check for the, the amount, and that, that was that. The American government came up with a formula for the Israelis to compensate the widows and children for their loss. This included a payment for shock and mental anguish. The widows got $25,000, 
with $10,000 for each of their children over five. An American government lawyer doubted that children under five could sufficiently comprehend the event to suffer shock and grief. The US proposed they should therefore receive nothing, an offer the Israelis accepted. Since the attack on the Liberty, the USA and Israel have grown ever closer. At the time, George Ball, the US Under Secretary of State, noted that it seemed clear to the Israelis that as American leaders did not have the courage to punish them for the blatant murder of American citizens, they would let them get away with anything. Okay, well, now what, we're what I'm trying to show you here is that yes, these governments really don't care about whether or not they should sacrifice their own citizens or if somebody else's, you know, in other words, they're very willing to run a false flag. Um, to summarize, I mean, we know that in 1993, the FBI organized and supplied the explosives. And when the uh, Patsy said, hey, these are real explosives, I thought they were going to be phony. He was told to go ahead and place them. The FBI did that, and the explosives went off and killed, what was it, I, I forget, 600 people or something like that. I might be wrong on that. I'm just off the top. Uh, anyway, at the World Trade Center in 1993. Okay, they didn't get their Patriot Act through. It wasn't bad enough. So they did the uh, Murrow Trade Center building, the federal building in Oklahoma City. They blew that up kind of as a test case. We know that was an inside job. Uh, they were just going to see if they could get away with it. You know, if, is, is anybody in the media going to not toe the, the official line? And they found out, hey, it's perfectly easy to get away with it. But they still didn't have enough, you know, of the American public afraid yet. So uh, along comes 9-11. Well, a lot of people still refuse to say uh, anybody in our government would commit that type of murder uh, of its own citizens. And then, of course, the people that say the Jews did it, the Jews did it. Well, first of all, the people that say Jews did it are very lazy intellectually because it isn't a Jewish philosophy that you're witnessing here. It is a Zionist philosophy equating to neocons or Nazis, whatever you want. It's an imperial, uh, colonial philosophy of global hegemony in the case of Israel, maybe not global, but at least regional hegemony, regardless of the rights and, and uh, presence of others. So we now know that Israel conspired with the United States to slaughter the people on the USS Liberty so that they could come in and, well, we're going to hear George Galloway explain about the flag of Israel, uh, the blue lines with the Star of David between them. The bottom line represents the, the Nile. The top line represents the Euphrates. And in between is the Jewish kingdom that the Zionists are trying to restore with the help of the United States. Well, we're going to go to George Galloway for a minute because he properly excoriates people who don't understand what, what, how much of a slaughter is going on against the Palestinians as if it's a different issue. See, a lot of people treat that as, oh, that's different from what we're doing. No, it's not. So we're going to go ahead and play George Galloway. We'll get into it right now. Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation. It's sometimes the great debate, but to be either, it needs you. I need your telephone calls above all, 44208-601-4555. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line, and remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be at zero or I'll have to move swiftly on because no one will understand either of us. You can also SMS the show on 4478-00060, sorry, 8066. You can email also at comment at 
www.ipsosocial.co.uk. And it being the 21st century, you can even tweet me at comment underscore press TV. Well, the situation in occupied Palestine, uh, occupied Jerusalem, besieged Gaza goes from bad to worse. A vortex of horror appears to have opened up. Murder, most foul, is everywhere. The problem is most people don't know that most of the murders are carried out by Israel on Palestinians. I mean, not just most, not even 100 to 1, 200 to 1, something like 300, 400, 500 to 1 in victims between Palestinian and Israeli. And it makes my blood boil, and I'm sure many of you, that the national news is broken into with breaking news that four, five Israelis have been cruelly murdered in Jerusalem. But four, five hundred, four, five thousand Palestinians barely gets a look in. There were 500 children, children, murdered by Israel in Gaza just this summer. But most people in the West don't even know. And many of those who know don't even care. We took some colloquial, anecdotal evidence amongst around 50 people in the course of the week. 80% of those people were able to identify the attack in the synagogue in West Jerusalem this week as an act of killing that took place in the Holy Land, but 80% of them couldn't name a single, not a single example of Israeli attacks on Palestinians. There had been one the very day before, before, the one day before, in the same city of Jerusalem, in which a Palestinian bus driver was tortured and hanged by settlers from the back of his bus, just the day before. But virtually nobody, incidentally, except those watching press TV, and a handful of other stations like it. Nobody even knew that it happened. You see, people can understand tit for tat, but if they don't know who's responding, retaliating to what, then it just looks like a one-sided onslaught by Palestinians against Israelis. Netanyahu, apparently oblivious, though probably simply careless, of the fact that collective punishment is a war crime. It is a crime against humanity to carry out collective punishments of an occupied people is a war crime the sentence for which is death by hanging, ever since the Nazi occupiers of Europe routinely carried out collective punishments in the occupied territory. Every time there was a resistance operation in occupied Europe, the Nazi occupiers lined up the local people, murdered them, destroyed their houses, took collective punishment to a very, very high level. Nuremberg outlawed collective punishment, described it as a crime against humanity. But an Israeli court just this day has ruled on the legality of a Netanyahu has already carried out the destruction of the homes of whole families who did nothing 
except be related by blood to the people who carried out the attack in the synagogue in Jerusalem. There ought therefore to be tonight an international arrest warrant issued by Interpol for the arrest on charges of crimes against humanity of Benjamin Netanyahu. Is there? Only a red carpet. Only impunity. So I'm asking the question, are most people ignorant of regular attacks by Israel on Palestinians? And if so, why? Ali is on the line in New York. Ali, I hear the weather's bad there. I hope we can hear you through the howling winds and the deep snow. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. George. It's again an honor to speak to you after a long time. Thank you, uh, sir. But I really uh, respect you, and uh, I am following you everywhere, wherever we see uh, something coming from you. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a great, great debate. Um, not only, in my view, people are ignorant, I, but I say, yes. Yeah, I mean, people are ignorant, and they are voluntarily ignorant. Uh, ignorant. They know the fact, but they don't want to speak. And why they are ignorant is because there is a great conspiracy going on. Um, on all the mainstream media, I would say, why is that? Because if the mainstream media tells the truth to the public, general public, like people like us, there would be a great change in public opinion about this this bad entity. And then these guys who are, who are, who are actually saying to the public that they are the, the, the guardian, they have the guardianship of uh, these human rights, they would be under fire. So I think there is ignorance going on, and I think this is a conspiracy going on. I don't I didn't think there is a deliberate effort to stop the information to the general public. Well, Ali, the New York Post, uh, sorry, the New York Times nearly confused them there one of the world's most famous newspapers, touched new depths in its coverage of the events that took place in the synagogue the other day. For the New York Times, there had been no murder of the bus driver the day before. For the New York Times, there had been no repeated attacks on mosques. Even the Al-Aqsa Mosque, over the preceding few weeks. For the New York Times, there had been no summer of slaughter in Gaza with thousands killed, thousands maimed, thousands of houses destroyed. For the New York Times, there was none of that. There was only the attack in the synagogue. I don't know what we can do, Ali, other than continue to fight for people to watch and read alternative media. Because anybody who got their news from the New York Times would have put their newspaper down, seething with anger at the apparent savagery of a people who half Americans, half of all Americans, think that Israel is occupied by the Palestinians rather than the other way around. Ali, over to you. I, I completely agree with you, Mr. George, and I think this is a very true picture, and I think th this is the great conspiracy going on, that when on the other side there's like thousands of murders, nobody talks about them, but on this side, you know why I am not taking that, that country's name from where I'm talking, but on this side of, of from this bad entity where even a superficial wound, this would be portrayed in this mainstream media as if there is the world is at the end. Um, but I think I think uh, people are waking up. I think there is, I mean, for example, this press TV and your program. I think this is spreading a lot of lot of information out there in the media. There are other other channels as well who are actually for our source. What we know, we just go from, the, like, I read New York Times every day, but then I go to your channel as well and see what is actually truth. And if you are a truth seeker, you can definitely find what is the truth. And I salute you and your team for doing this great job. Thank you very much indeed. 
Let's go to the next caller. Peher in London. Are most people ignorant of regular attacks by Israel? Okay, uh, we took that out right away because I want to get this one last thing in. It's, it's uh, a real good one. The, uh, uh, oh, I'm having a brain fade on it now. Anyway, uh, this is a, a real news network analysis of it. it we're having a, a class war struggle, basically, not a race war. That's an important thing to understand. So um, we need solidarity between workers and the undocumented people that we're ta calling aliens or illegal aliens or whatever. Those people have the same exact interests as you and I. And roll this video and I'll see you next week. Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. So here at The Real News, we've covered President Obama's executive action to give some 4 million undocumented immigrants temporary legal status. Remember, undocumented immigrants that qualify must be a parent of a U.S. citizen or a legal resident, and you must have resided in the U.S. for at least five years. But what you don't see being covered in the mainstream media is this issue being discussed around wages. And what do these policies do in shaping our economy, and how do they affect affect working people. Here to help us answer some of these questions is our in-studio guest, Bill Barry. Bill is a retired director of labor studies at the Community College of Baltimore County in Dundalk, and he was a union organizer for 20 years before that. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Great to be here, Jessica. So, Bill, this issue around wages, as I mentioned in the, the introduction, right. you were a union organizer for yes. 20 years, so you've seen working class people sort of react to undocumented workers. Well, I was, I was actually involved in organizing organizing them. Oh, you were? I was working in Texas. I had campaigns along the Rio Grande Valley and in the clothing industry down there. And quite a few of the people who lived in Mexico, I never asked about their legal status. They, they were workers. They wanted better wages. The native workers in Texas understood that and there was no problem. So do you feel like that that is a typical example? Because um, I would think that the perception is that these undocumented workers are gonna somehow threaten their jobs. What, what was what was? Well, I think thing? generally the issue for workers is what makes a good job and what threatens it. And the latest bugaboo is undocumented workers. And 30 years ago it was black workers or women and a hundred years ago, when my great-grandfather came over here from Ireland, it was Irish workers. It was not necessarily the stereotype today of an immigrant worker is it's from Central America or Mexico. But back in the Baltimore, there were big signs in a lot of the stores, N-I-N-A, no Irish need apply. Yeah. And the native-born workers claimed that it was the immigrants who were undercutting the conditions. Well, let's look at the statistics, because let's get some sure, numbers absolutely. behind this. So first question, do undocumented Im immigrants have any effect on, on wages? Specifically, let's talk about first low-skilled American workers. I don't think so. There's some impact because they're threatenable. They, that is, the employer can go to them and say, well, if you put too much effort into trying to raise your wages or get better conditions, I not only can fire you, but I can have you deported. But I think if all allegedly 11 million undocumented workers suddenly evaporated tomorrow, I don't see Walmart raising wages. Mm. I don't see the other industries, the landscaping industry, the construction industry, miraculously bringing wages up. Mm. And where wages come up, as we see here in Baltimore, for example, in the hospitality industry where workers are organizing and they are foreign born, they are, nobody knows what their status is, but they're employed in a hotel, for example, they want better conditions and they join with the other workers in that hotel to get those conditions. Okay. And that's how conditions are gonna get better and that's how conditions got worse because workers lost that sense of direction, that sense of struggle, that sense of determination to control the job that our great-grandparents had. So would it be fair to say then, um, let's take your example of these 11 million undocumented workers. Yes. Let's say that they don't go away, but let's say they're legalized. If they now are part of this sort of legal workforce, could we see there being more pressure on employers to have higher wages, things of that nature? Sure. And I think you go back to the time after the Civil War. 
The biggest fear among white workers was four million freed slaves in the workforce. And what they found in the cases where they organized together black workers and white workers, the rising tide lifted all those boats and they made them go up. And I think the same thing would happen here. And I think the problem is that undocumented workers are just the latest diversion for workers. Mm. And they're frantically scrambling around trying to figure out what do I have to do to put the pieces back together because the world is not what it was when I came into the workforce. And I'm a speak as a parent of two boys who are out, young men now looking for work. Mm -hmm. And it's real, real different how they are. And it has nothing at all to do with legal status or documentation. It's just retail, for example. They don't want you to have a regular schedule. They want you to be on call. And we have seen an economy transformed where I think millions of people are never going to have full-time jobs again. So there are lots of applicants for these jobs which have been de-skilled. So anybody can come in and do them. Mm -hmm. And the employers are taking advantage of that. And they would take advantage of it, of you, Jessica, or of me, as well as people who are undocumented. So it, I'm listening to you, Bill, and it seems like what I'm hearing is that working people and undocumented people are in the same fight. Abs absolutely. And, and for me, though, do you think it's, why has it been so difficult then to kind of bridge that gap? Because I don't necessarily see white working class people and black working class people on the front lines pushing for undocumented people to get legal no, status. That's right. But you didn't see necessarily 50 years ago white working class people and some blacks pushing for civil rights. And the argument then was, oh, black workers are going to take my job. And often companies would recruit them as scabs to come up from the South, and they were brought into uh, situations over which they had no control. But once black workers and white workers started to understand in the 1930s that they were all working for the same employers, and if they would all work together, that things would be better, and it took a long time to overcome racism, just as it does now to overcome that hysteria about foreign-born people. I mean, I talk to people and they say, well, about these immigrants. And I say, well, I am a child of immigrants. Mm. We are all children of immigrants. There you was a, a great graphic of the Native Americans uh, welcoming the colonists for Thanksgiving and saying, well, they don't speak our language, but we'll give them food anyhow. And I think that it's, again, this hatred of race, of ethnic status, men and women. People learn it through the media, they learn it in school, they learn it in their neighborhoods, and it's just something that keeps us divided and conquered as working people. And when workers stick together, regardless of age, race, sex, ethnic background, I mean, it's been a huge movement for uh, sexual preference, for gay workers or transgender workers to come into the workplace and be treated like everybody else yeah. as workers. And as long as workers are divided, they're going to be conquered. And we have seen that the conditions now are not even close to what it was, what they were when I started working. So in whose interest is it then to divide and conquer? Let's, the, let's the, the, Well, the one percent and the one-tenth of one percent. The uh, Koch brothers have increased their income, their, their holdings, a billion dollars a month in the last five years. This is Koch Industries, yeah. yeah. But Walmart, I had a discussion with somebody at a public event I went to on Sunday, and I said that the Walton family's total net worth is something like $250 million. And Billion. Million. Million. Yeah. Okay. But there was just a demonstration this morning at the daughter, Alice Walton, has a condo in New York, $26 million. And a group of Walmart workers took a food, food donation box from in front of one of the stores and put it in front of her condo. And I said to the people at this event that that $260 million comes out of the fact that one third of Walmart workers are on food stamps and yeah. have no insurance and various types of public assistance. And as long as those workers worry about what your color is or where you're from or what language you speak, the Walton family is going to just ride home free. Yeah. And the amount of change. Uh, you're from New York. You've maybe seen the New York paper. I just saw uh, last week in the business section of the New York paper that mega yachts and mega private planes are the biggest sellers going. People have got tons of money. A guy just bought a penthouse with some friends, $90 million. 
and he's not even going to live there. Yeah. It's an investment. And so we can see all the signs of social inequality. And the trick is, what are we going to do about it? And if I'm fighting you because of what language you speak or what color you are or where you came from, I'm dead. I'm out of the game. Well, let me ask you that question. What do we do about it? I think we have to go, workers need to, uh, what I call, get out of your gated community. That is, white workers need to stop just talking to only white workers. They need to go out and talk to other people in the workplace, people in their communities. Workers need to get organized. They need to start unions. Unions need to put resources into organizing. Um, there's some campaigns going on here. There's even one at Jimmy John's, which is almost self-organizing with the industrial workers of the world. That is, they don't have organizing staff as I used to do it. But very little organizing going on. I think workers need to do independent political action. I think it's pretty clear that the two parties don't solve the problems. Mm. And what we saw, for example, in the state of Maryland this uh, last election was workers are frantically looking around for an alternative. And so they figure, well, if you're in office, I'm, you, things are horrible, so I'm going to put you out. And a place like Dundalk, all Democrats had run Dundalk in office, been in office for three generations. Every one of them got voted out. Everyone. And it's just people are frantically looking for some solution. And they need to look at joining together. They need to look at political action. They need to look at talking to people in their communities about getting together and not arguing. It's like so my father-in-law is in a hospital rehab. The guy in the next bed is another white guy listen to Rush Limbaugh around the clock. Yeah, yeah. And so you listen to this stuff, you watch this stuff, you begin to believe it. You hear it often enough. And people need to find alternate sources of information. They need to look at labor history, at a worker's history, and just get out and do it. All right. Bill Barry joining us in <laughs> studio. Thank you so much for being with us. Jessica, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.